Okay. Okay, hi everybody and welcome to today's session on decentralising political economies. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Poppy Bowers and I'm Exhibition Curator at the Whitworth Art Gallery, part of the University of Manchester. And um, I'm going to be moderating today's session and giving a short introduction. Um, so I thought I'd start just briefly by describing the Whitworth, um, for those of you that, that might not be familiar. Um, the Whitworth is a, is a public art gallery that was founded in, in 1889 with a strong social purpose to give free access to art and education. And as the first public gallery in a park, it saw itself as playing um, an inspiring role in, in shaping citizenship and well-being for the, the working people of the industrial city. Um, so today it's, it's got a collection of around 60,000 works across historic and contemporary art and design. Um, a significant part of which is textiles, of course, which, um, which is what the city's industry was built upon. Um, our original um, Edwardian building has expanded over the decades and it's now made up of um, 12 gallery spaces, a learning studio, a study centre um, and a cafe and shop, of course. Um, it sits on the university campus on the edge of the rapidly developing city centre opposite the city hospital and within dense residential neighbourhoods of Rushholme, Brunswick, Mosside and Hume. In recent years, um, we've returned with a renewed focus to the gallery's founding principles to ask ourselves, how do we use the museum today? How does it function as a civic space? And how do our collections, exhibitions and learning programmes speak to the complex issues and urgencies of our contemporary life? And part of that thinking has led to the development of an exhibition and research project on economics, which will take form over the next couple of years. And it's taking shape through collaboration with the Alliance Manchester Business School and with the Centre of Plausible Economies, a platform that uses artistic action and critical thinking to map and reimagine economic systems. And this is initiated by the artist Catherine Baum and curator Cuba Strader, um, who've worked closely with the economic geographer, Dr. Catherine Gibson. So very broadly, the project looks to reclaim economics as a set of social relations of which we're all part in our everyday life. Um, and provocatively titled Economics the Blockbuster, it also aims to rework the economy of the exhibition from being a practice of entertainment and consumption to instead a space for open-ended, process-based socially engaged activity that carries out real world action. So of course our understanding of the role of art and the very conditions of its production, distribu distribution and circulation is at the core of this. Um, and that's been explored in the research strand of the project which is titled Decentralising Political Economies. Um, so here we are. Um, DPE, which we affectionately are calling it for short, is a long-term and open-ended open research collaboration between the Whitworth Art Gallery, the City Lab, which forms part of the Institute of Art and Technology at Liverpool John Moores University's School of Art and Design, and the Association of Art at Util, of which we're going to hear more about during this session. Um, the aim of decentralising political economies project is to propose and examine how art can be used as a tool for developing forms of ground up and constituent social activism and um i you know i just have to say that obviously this, this session couldn't come at a more timely moment given the um the legal strike action taking place by art workers at tate and south bank center in the face of cuts to low-paid roles in their organizations and across the most diverse teams in the institutions, so across retail, catering and publishing. And I think this is in part a legacy of the, of the pressures on institutions to diversify and generate their own commercial income. But ultimately it speaks to the inherent contradiction that sits at the heart of many public art institutions where the capitalist logic of their management systems simply do not tally with the leftist radical politics of their public programming and communications. And I'm slightly paraphrasing the artist Taishani there, who wrote um, a brilliant essay in the Art Review this week titled Why Art Workers Must Demand the Impossible, um, which is freely available online if, if you haven't read it. Um, so bearing you know, this context in mind, um, today's session 
we'll explore how decentralising political economies can contribute to rethinking the institution. So the gallery, the museum, the art school, as we'll hear. Um, so rethinking the institution as a more equitable mode of practice that's no longer governed by or um, dominated by capitalist and growth orientated logic. And to do this, it calls for a reinvention of what we consider to be art and the role art and its institutions have in contemporary life. The session will introduce some key terms such as one-to-one -one scale practice, usership and the, the notion of the undercommons. And we'll draw on case studies including the Association of Arte Util, as well as socially engaged projects set in the specific locality of post-industrial South Wales. The speakers in today's session, um, which I'm really pleased to welcome, are John Byrne, Director of the Uses of Art at Liverpool John Moores University, curator and educator Alessandra Saviotti, and the artist Owen Griffiths. So hello and welcome to the three of you. Um, before I introduce the first of those speakers, um, I'll just say that the session is going to run for um, an hour and 45 minutes. We're going to finish about quarter to two. Um, the next session is, is starting quite promptly at two o'clock after us. Um, each speaker will present for 20 minutes and then we'll have around 15 minutes for them to respond to each other and start a discussion before we then open it up to questions from the audience. Um, I have a couple of house rules to quickly mention. Firstly, um, to ensure the session runs smoothly, if you could keep your microphone turned off, that would be great. Um, this should have been done automatically, but sometimes it doesn't always work. So please do check, thanks. And secondly, um, we just ask you to, to use the chat function only for questions and comments to the panel. Um, and we really do encourage questions. So please, um, please do write them into the chat box. And if it's for a particular person, um, a particular speaker, do please, um, if you can, write their name in capitals at the start of the question, which just helps us track them more easily. Okay. Okay, without further um, delay, I'll, I'll introduce the first speaker, which is John Byrne. Um, John is a reader in the uses of art at Liverpool John Moores University, where he's also the director of the uses of art City Lab. In partnership with the Internationale, a confederation of seven European art organisations, he's led Liverpool John Moores University's participation in a number of exhibition research projects and publications that each work to reconsider the formal systems of art and art institutions. So these have included the uses of art, the legacy of 1848 and 1989, a constituency's research strand, and he was lead editor of the resulting publication, The Constituent Museum, Constellations of Knowledge, Politics and Mediation, that was published in, um, in 2018. John is an active member of the Association of Arte Util and is committed to growing the association's network as a worldwide constituency of artists, designers, activists and makers who wish to explore ways in which we can use art as a ground up tool for imagining ourselves otherwise. John is currently researcher in residence at the Whitworth where I have the pleasure of working with him and talking and thinking with him and um, he's lead researcher and editor of the Decentralising Political Economies research platform. Okay, I'm going to hand over to you, John. Thank you. Okay, hi, hi everybody. Um, I'm going to just uh, share a screen, if that's okay. Okay, um, thanks very much, Poppy, for the introduction and to, to everybody for, for joining today. What I want to do in this first 20 minutes really is to flesh out the decentralising political economies project a little more uh, and to do that as a means also of introducing some of the things that both Owen and Alessandra are going to say and hopefully to be able to, to kickstart a, a conversation and in a sense the project itself which we hope will kind of grow and develop for, for several years. Um, as Poppy's just uh, outlined, Decentralising Political Economies is a research collaboration between the Whitworth, the City Lab at Liverpool John Moores University School of Art and Design and the Association of Art AT. Um, the, the kind of broad aim, also as Poppy's outlined, um, of the project is to begin to, to propose, develop and test uh, toolkits for collaborative uses of art as a 
means to develop um, activist forms of constituency and, and community production. Uh, initially, this was going to be um, a project which, oh, works now. Initially, this was going to be a project which was going to take the form of a couple of seminars and perhaps a, a publication. Um, but the um, COVID pandemic um, forced us a, a, a rethink, really. And um, after some conversations with Alistair Hudson, who's the uh, director of the Whitworth Art Gallery, we thought it was a really important moment, as, as Poppy's outlined, to begin um, rethinking how we might use art as a tool for real ground up social activism and change. Um, what role and function that museums and galleries could, could play in that um, form of activism as well. The impetus for this is, is, as we know, and as everybody's been discussing, that the whole COVID pandemic is, has, is, is forcing and accelerating every individual and community and local and regional, national and, and international community to begin rethinking itself. Um, however, um, not all of that rethinking, as Poppy's just suggested and as we all know, is, is coming from, from the left. It's also an opportunity for a globalised neoliberal um, logic to entrench itself and, and to, to rethink us for us. Um, and an obvious example of that, as I'm sure everybody knows, is the Great Reset Project that the World Economic Forum, uh, Forum suggested. Um, and, and, and what we wanted to begin to do was to, to, to think of um, how we might engage meaningfully um, with this complex set of developments and proposals and, and propositions that are going to take place over the, ne the next years um, because none of us obviously want this um, new and emerging post-COVID culture to be something that's served up for us from um, a, um, a neoliberal economic bias. Now, one of the things that's been occupying my thinking for several years now, which I want to outline very quickly, um, is that the conditions of, of, of action um, within the art world and the world in, in general now um, have become much more asymmetrical. I, I, I no longer think or have thought for many years that there is simply um, a rhetoric of the left and a rhetoric of the right. Uh, and that we can stand off against each other. Um, I, I, I believe that uh, one of the successes of, unfortunately, globalised neoliberal logic is its occupation of discourses and terminologies uh, of the traditional left. Um, and that's not to raise a white flag. It's just to say that the, 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 the site of struggle, if you like, is... Uh, asymmetrical. It's now uh, within and over the kinds of terminologies and conditions that, that once would have uh, previously defined clear oppositions, but they're now uh, quite the same. So um, I've got a couple of questions that I've kind of outlined that I want to look at. Um, and I want to kind of begin to propose um, a way that the um, project that we're proposing um decentralizing political economies it uh, might work uh, why we're doing it which is i've just begun to explain and um, uh, and how we're going to go about um developing these projects in order to do this i want to very quickly look at three possible examples from from quite diverse fields and then revisit them in order to see how they might be brought together in order to help us think things differently um, my argument is that if we are living in, in asymmetrical times, we can't rely upon art or museums or galleries as we know it or knew it to be to help us develop these forms of counteractivism. They're also occupied by neoliberalism. One of the things that we might have to do is to open ourselves to rethink the possibilities of art as a form of action 
and engagement and activism and how we might use museums and galleries within um, this struggle in order to effectively open up some space for, for change. Now, one of the, the first of the three examples I want to look at super briefly, and um, you're probably very familiar with this, and, and if not, there is now a, an awful lot of literature that's going about this, was um, Project Cybersyn. Uh, project Cybersyn was um, a, um, a project that was developed uh, in the early 1970s, from 71 to 73, uh, under the request of the uh, Chilean government led by Allende. Um, and it saw a management um, cybernetics expert in Guru Stafford Beer being invited by the Chilean government to help them think of how they might develop successful feedback loops which would uh, decentralise the centre. Um, gather information continually from different parts of the country, feed that information back and enable the centre to then act and, 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 uh, and change its, its discussions. Now, one of the things that I'm becoming really um, interested in, um, one of the key bulwarks of uh, decentralising political economies, is to look to a whole range of uh, examples of practice and uh, historical and contemporary theories that center around the notions of decentralization, political decentralization and political uh, opposition um, that seek to support ideas of non-representational politics. Um, ideas such as uh, Project Cybersyn are just one amongst many. You know, one can think of uh, the Zapatista movement, for example, or the democratic confederalism uh, proposed by Abdul Rashid. Um, but key to this really is to, to think of these examples as um, resources and unfinished contested sites um, over which we can continue to develop um, our struggle to use museums and art as a propositional toolkit for real world social, economic and political exchange. My second example is um, uh, an exhibition uh, which took place in the Van Abbey Museum in the Netherlands between 2013 and 2014 called the Museum of Arte Util. Uh, the Museum of Arte Util uh, brought together some of the ideas developed by an, uh, an artist uh, and artivist as she often calls herself, Tanya Bagheera, and her proposition which she began to develop around about 2010-2011 of the global networked online association of art at util or useful art the idea here was that art should no longer simply be a symbolic and representational model of how the world could be but um, art could be used as a tool not just by artists but com by communities uh, for for social uh, economic political uh, radicality and ground up uh, change now, um, some of these ideas will be developed in the uh, uh, next uh, discussion by Alessandra Saviotti. Um, but you will see, um, as you're looking at the screen on the right, an image of the um, archive of the Arte of Arte Util, which is an online resource of artists' uh, works and propositions for um, social. Uh, and, and cultural and, and community change. Um, what really intrigued me about this uh, exhibition and this show was that when it first opened, it was quite difficult for um, a non-art specialist public to, to, to engage with. Um, it concerns one-to-one -one scale art practices, um, practices which happen in the real world, um, and the representation within a gallery space and the difficulties of doing that. However, what was really interesting about this show is the Van Abbey Museum took the radical step of inviting anybody, communities or otherwise, to use the space of the museum and the gallery and to use the resources that were available by the exhibition to begin to hold meetings, groups, discussions, um, 
And because of that, the exhibition itself became um, one of the most successful exhibitions in terms of footfall that the Van Abbey Museums ever had. And it began to get us to think really about how museums and galleries themselves uh, might become um, sites of, of activity and action in which museums themselves are used otherwise. Now, during the development of this uh, exhibition, a, a thinker and philosopher called Stephen Wright was asked to um, develop a, a lexicon of usership, how we might use art to, to um, form oppositional um, activism. And he became interested in the term Museum 3.0, or the idea that museums and galleries would no longer be places where you came to see embodied objects and extract meaning from them, which would help you symbolically reacquaint yourself with the world outside, but we could become sites of active change as well. Now, one of the catches uh, in that idea that Poppy alluded to is for that to be full blooded, it would also mean that the hierarchical management systems of museums and galleries which are quite traditional and quite pyramidal, would also have to change. And that that change would also be have to negotiate constituently. Quite how we do that, we don't know. But one of the ideas of decentralising political economies is to try and help build toolkits which might help us begin that journey. Um, most people agree that museums, galleries has to change, and our uses of art has to change. So what we now need to do is begin to imagine how that could happen um, and to build strategies which would meaningfully affect that stage uh, change. Um, this is a two images um, from a project by Owen, Owen Griffiths, who will be also speaking later, as you know, um, taken from the Chabanog project. And I'm using these, this image really to to think about um, and to introduce people who may not know to the idea of one-to-one -one scale art practice. Um, and it's the third ingredient in this kind of Gordonian knot that we're talking about. One-to-one -one scale art practice um, is really a label for those art practices led by individual or groups of artists who work with communities to make real-world propositional change. They don't necessarily rely on the production of art objects that then go into museums and galleries. Um, they don't rely upon the idea of one single artist necessarily taking credit for developing an artwork with a community. They become projects which can exist and have a life of their own and will grow beyond the initial impetus that uh, an artist or creatives or communities might bring to them. They're in essence uh, ground up forms of uh, proposition which are instigated by artists. Now, as I said, that leaves us with a really, really interesting, um, an interesting kind of, kind of problem. Um, museums and galleries, um, as we know them, um, are really only 200 years old. They start to happen as a consequence of the French Revolution and their whole conceptual and physical architectures are built around um, seeing objects, seeing objects which we uh, are now educated to think of as being separate from, um, though related to, the world outside the museum and gallery made by special people called artists who embed a kind of quality within those objects that are then extracted by a viewer as a form of transaction underpinned by this western art world logic which then gives an aesthetic or cultural experience which is emancipatory and can change the way you think and, and work with the world what museums and galleries are very successful at doing because of this logic is taking anything um, into the peer view of the art world system and reformatting it as art under those basic terms and conditions. What museums and galleries that we know uh, as have been developed from the West aren't so good at 
is then extending that logic beyond the peer view of the museum and art gallery and art world into everyday life. It begins to fall down. What we need to do because of that is to develop new ways of rethinking how we use museums, how we use art, how we begin to rethink the uh, museum and gallery as a site of activism and social change, which will allow in turn users of museums and galleries and users of art to reacquaint themselves with the uh, readily available forms of um, toolkits for, for, for activism and localised change, which they could then begin to use as meaningful propositions to challenge the centralisation of deregulatory logic. Um, and one of the things that we wish to do with this project, uh, Decentralising Political Economies, is to bring together um, discourses that are beginning to develop within museums and galleries that want to rethink their position and their relationship to their communities locally, nationally and internationally. Um, artists who want to work in different ways and constituents who want to use art as forms of proposition alternative change and to begin to suggest um, as, as I began uh, this introduction with toolkits for change um, which will allow us to think outside a primarily western purview, uh, purview of, of artistic experience. Now that's, that's a very very difficult proposition it's it's something which is going to be the beginning and start of a process which which has already begun in different places it's something which we can't second guess it's something which we will need to work towards and for the purposes of this particular project this particular contribution to those growing global debates as i suggest we want to 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 use the resources of historical and existing and, and future propositions of decentralizing uh, political radicality in terms of thought and practice as a means to, to, to rethink how we might use art and we might reuse museums and galleries as, as power stations for so social, political uh, and economic opposition uh, in ways that don't simply replicate the neoliberal logic of the centre. Um, and I guess I can end there. Great, thanks so much, John. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Thank you for that. That introduces some, um, some great um, thoughts that we can take up, um, that Alessandra and Owen can take up. Um, so I'm now gonna introduce the second speaker, um, which is Alessandra Saviotti, who is a curator and educator who lives in Amsterdam. She's PhD candidate at the Liverpool John Moores University School of Art and Design, where her focus is on socially engaged art, collaborative practices and arte util. Her work aims to realise projects where the public becomes a co-producer in the spirit of usership. Her reflection is taking into consideration collaborative processes according to the motto, cooperation is better than competition. She is co-founder of the art collective Aspiramente, a group which focuses on the common definition of work in progress, seeking the contribution of operators in other fields than art for interdisciplinary projects that are free from time constraints. She was part of the curatorial team of the Muse Museum of Art at Util, which John has just mentioned at the Van Abbe Museum. And since 2014, she's been collaborating with the Association of Art at Util um, especially aiming at emancipating the usership around the archive. She's tutor at the International Master Artist Educator at the University of the Arts in Arnhem and also teaches at Academ um, Academia Unidi in Biella, Italy. Um, Alessandra, over to you. Thank you, Poppy. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen too, just a second. All right. Can you see it? Yeah. All right. So first of all, I would like to thank all the organizers also of this conference because I have been uh, 
um, watching the previous sessions and it was uh, really awesome. So thank you for that. Um, and also thank you to Poppy Owen and John to be here. <laughs> Hopefully we will have a conversation together later. Um, so I'm, so as, uh, yeah, some of the key words uh, were already mentioned before. So um, I'm gonna, I, I, I'll, I will expand a little bit on uh, how the Arte Util archive, uh, which was uh, um, put together for the Museum of Arte Util exhibition at the Van Ami Museum, uh, has been used in the context of education, both informal and informal. Uh, and in particular, I will introduce uh, uh, two projects. Uh, one is called Broadcasting the Archive that I co-curated with Gemma uh, uh, Medina Estupignan. Um, and uh, basically it became a real tool uh, we used to sort of infiltrate the institution of education, suggesting and implementing uh, another way of teaching, which is also inspired by feminist and critical pedagogy uh, and the idea of the undercommons as well. Um, and then I will, in the second part of the presentation, I will explain how the Association de Arte Util uh, used its way of, uh, let's say, being. <laughs> and so not a formal institution or association or an organization uh, to gain traction in the institutional environment, such as, uh, for instance, the museum collection, uh, using its very same principle. Um, and then all of this uh, uh, has been done, uh, let's say, in the spirit of usership, uh, hacking and uh, the undercommons. Uh, which became a sort of common threads um, in the working methodology of the association de arte util, or let's say what I uh, identified as such, and in particular when it challenges the traditional way of collecting, events making, spectatorship and ownership. Um, so um, let's say that my interest is uh, really to, uh, to highlight how uh, Arte Util provides case studies through its archive, which is uh, available for free online on the Arte Util website, uh, in order to promote and emancipate, and emancipate usership, and uh, in particular, how it can really become um, a fertile ground where to experiment, but also conceive uh, inclusive education models and toolkits. And uh, this is also, would be also, let's say, my contribution to the Decentralizing Political Economies platform because I'm, I have been busy to think about uh, the toolkit session and in particular to uh, resource for education, which, which hopefully uh, are gonna work both in the formal and informal education, um, education environment. So how I would I try to do so? Um, I'm going to talk about uh, two case studies in particular um, that I really think, or at least I, uh, over the course of the years, I see that they can really uh, challenge effectively uh, the education system, but also propose a model that other people uh, could use, but also could uh, research and uh, could, could add also other uh, meanings and tools to that. Um, so this is uh, the first project, uh, which is called Broadcasting the Archive. Broadcasting the Archive is uh, a collaborative project uh, that I have been curated together, together with uh, my colleague, Gemma Medina Stupignan. Uh, we started putting together the project in uh, 2015, uh, right after the Museum of Arte Util exhibition was over, because we were pretty much, uh, let's say, working uh, in close um, collaboration with the artists so whose practices and projects are included into the archive. And we really wanted to, we were always talking about, okay, how can we use the archive? Um, this project is really meaningful and amazing. How can we really uh, try to, um, you know, to, to support also these kind of practices? Uh, beyond the museum and beyond the, um, the time of the exhibition. So our aim after the, the exhibition was over uh, was to become serious about what, what we were trying to, to say with the exhibition. So let's repurpose uh, the, the museum. Let's try to use the spaces of the museum in another way and so on. So, um, and also we decided to develop the project independently uh, even though we were always in conversation with uh, Tania Bruguera, of course, and uh, with uh, the museum, the Manabe Museum, but also a different kind of institutions. Um, um, because we, we really wanted to, 
to go beyond the, the walls of the museum. In a way, uh, since this, uh, the, the case studies that have been um, included in the Arte Util Archive are um, practices that they were a little bit uh, put outside the, the context of the museum or the canon of the, of the museum. So we said, okay, let's try to, um, to find a way to really support uh, these kind of practices and artists uh, also beyond the context of, of the exhibition. So the project basically consisted um, and consists because it's, uh, uh, or, uh, it's still ongoing, uh, even if it transforms itself. So it consisted of a series of city tours, workshops, um, taking into uh, consideration the Arte Util archive, um, but also at a certain point we started uh, to understand that um, we really needed to um, to go deep into the research. So we, we really needed to go uh, deep uh, to understand the, the urgencies of the, uh, uh, of the artists, but also the constituencies and the, of the group, sometimes of art, uh, activists, that uh, they, um, uh, they, they created this project. Um, but then uh, while we were uh, going all over uh, Europe mainly, uh, but also we, we presented the project in, uh, in Turkey and the United States, uh, we saw that uh, this archive and also this way of um, mm, uh, being in conversation, not only with uh, the artists and the practitioners, but also with the uh, other group of people that were, uh, let's say, using this project in, uh, in another way beyond art, be, beyond art, it became really important and it, could, it could be transformed as a so, and used as a sort of, uh, let's say, pedagogical methodology. So, um, so at, at a certain point we were invited to um, more frequent, more often to give some lectures and explaining the project. So we said, okay, but why don't we try to really uh, create a curriculum and, uh, or um, a syllabus that can be uh, really used uh, into art schools, for instance, and, uh, and universities. So uh, that in a way can take into account all these radical practices uh, in order to think, uh, not just to think about theory or about what is behind this kind of project, but really to, to change the way these kind of practices, and I mean arte util, but also socially engaged art uh, practices are, uh, are taught and explained in, in uh, art schools. Um, so then uh, after uh, we started a little bit working with this idea of uh, creating a curriculum, uh, we, uh, we were, uh, let's say, um, we faced a sort of struggle, which is, uh, is it possible to teach a radical approach that seeks to reorganize the existing configuration of the system within the system itself? And then again, in, like the, working in this kind of context uh, was always, we were always facing, and I was always facing, and, and still I am facing this uh, contradiction no? between, okay, let's uh, uh, use the real of, uh, of art in order to create tools and change, but let's really try to um, uh, realize one-to-one -one practices. So practices that work for real, not just in the realm of art, but also um, in the real world. So let's be serious about that. Um, so we um, uh, implemented a curriculum, which is uh, uh, part of the International Master Artist Educator, where I teach with my collaborator, Gemma, uh, at the University of the Arts in Arnhem, the Netherlands. And um, to create a curriculum, we really um, use the same methodology. So the curriculum um, comprehends city tours, visits to special exhibitions that are close to the topic of Arte Util, and then of course, um, every time changes because the museums and institutions every uh, here organize different exhibitions. So it's really, let's say, flexible uh, the way we, we work. Um, and then uh, we also have a six weeks mentorship with different artists and art organization. And of course, a series of reading groups uh, where we analyze words like usership or concept like the undercommons, but also concept like friendship, for instance, or like uh, vulnerability, all these kind of uh, um, you know, terms that can have a different value for 
uh, each of us if you want to. Um, so as I was saying before, every year the curriculum changes according to some specific urgencies, but also taking into account uh, the feedback of the previous group of students uh, and also uh, the feedback of our uh, fellow teachers. And uh, it is basically constituency led because every year uh, while we, we, we write the curriculum, we came uh, across different projects uh, and different artists and we really want to use the possibility to be uh, included in a, in a um, let's say traditional institution, which is the art school, um, to support also the research of the artists that we invite to be uh, with us um, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is the group of the students that we had this year. And uh, I just want to say that I'm super proud because this year, despite all the circumstances, the circumstances, they brilliantly graduate with amazing projects. So um, I'm super happy about that. Um, and also I, I choose uh, this image because we were uh, visiting an, uh, an, art, an art organization uh, in, um, in Eindhoven. Uh, and uh, it's super important that basically the voice of the, this um, experimental organization or um, non-traditional art organization is heard by themselves. So uh, I don't want, uh, okay, I'm the, let's say, educator, the teacher for my students, like, let's say, the point of reference for them, but I don't want that uh, my voice is, uh, let's say, mediating uh, the voice of the artist. So uh, I really uh, I think it's super important that the students hear directly from uh, the artists themselves about the strategies and the way of working um, without any, let's say, layer of, uh, of mediation. And then in this way, I think students can also build a sort of, uh, again, one-to-one -one relationship with the projects themselves. Um, another project uh, which I um, I really want to, to talk about before uh, going to the second part of the uh, of the talk, it's uh, Techeografias, which is a project that I'm super inspired by. Um, and I'm glad that uh, the artist Daniel Godin and Nivonne, uh, and the, in collaboration with the Assembly of Indigenous Migrants in Mexico City, realized that because this is one of the projects that uh, I always uh, go back um, uh, when I'm thinking about how can we really affect so social change. Uh, inter infiltrating in uh, institutions, even if it's um, not easy and not uh, really straightforward. But so basically, Daniel, Daniel as uh, uh, in collaboration with the uh, Assembly of Indigenous Migrants in Mexico City, has created uh, a series of uh, monographs called uh, Tequiografias uh, through a Tequio. So Tecchio is um, a communal system of organization expressed uh, in collaborative practices, mandatory and unpaid work, uh, which uh, the um, uh, Assembly of Indigenous Migrants use in order to organize um, themselves. And um, basically the goal of the project is really to um, change uh, how uh, the, some topics uh, uh, that are part of uh, uh, the, um, the tradition or the way of living of the indigenous migrants in Mexico City are taught in school, in schools in, in the city. So basically monographias is uh, like, le let's say, this kind of uh, um, um, cards that, has, uh, uh, that are used by kids in schools in order to learn about different topics. But then uh, they are always um, uh, created and designed uh, by you know, like with a specific point of view, which is not this point of view of the uh, indigenous migrants. So Daniel, uh, together with them, they uh, made new drawings and they, but they also make, uh, um, brought uh, the explanation of the different topics uh, that uh, kids can learn in school. And um, Daniel is a teacher himself. So he was able to make circulating these new tequiografias uh, in the, um, in, uh, in the um, usual uh, stationary store where uh, kids buy their uh, school materials. So in this way, I think this is a really uh, a nice example of uh, uh, how this kind of project can work on a one-to-one -one scale because 
uh, the kids go to the shop, buy the techeografias, and they study the topics uh, on these techeografias. Uh, but also is the artistic proposition of what it is, because this project can work very well in a museum environment. It can be used um, as a model to, to create another uh, kind of another different project. So um, this is one of uh, my favorite example of uh, what I mean when, I'm, when I say that we, we should uh, infiltrate the system using uh, tools uh, that we know, which are the tool of art in our case, uh, to really change something. Um, I'm going to proceed uh, with uh, the second part of my talk. I, I hope to be on schedule. I think so, otherwise Poppy just wave me. Okay. So this is a, a quote that I would like to um, um, uh, read to you because it's uh, uh, one of my, uh, let's say, favorite quote by Tanya Bruguera when, uh, um, to ex that I use to explain uh, what art util means. Uh, I precisely choose this one because it's from 2011, so way a little bit before all this uh, association de arte util and arte util as a movement was sort of institutionalized. Uh, so I think it's really um, important. And um, so I just read it. Useful art is a way of working with aesthetic experiences that focus on the implementation of art in society, where art's function is no longer to be a space for signaling problems, but the place from which to create the proposal and implementation of possible solutions. We should go back to the times where art was not something to look at in all, but something to generate from. If it's political art, it deals with the consequences. If it deals with the consequences, I think it has to be useful art. So I really think that uh, one way to uh, uh, really intervene and uh, uh, change the way institution operates is really starting from ourselves. Um, also because uh, museums and institutions, um, you know, like are made by the people that uh, work in there and run the institutions. Of course, also, you know, like if, if we think about space, um, it's super important to change the space and uh, to uh, to welcome other kind of bodies in uh, in the institutions, but uh, I think we really need to be serious and to to and to be brave and to start from uh, the way we work and the way we understand our work and uh, what does it mean to to really change something. Um, so uh, going back to to the idea of the archive, um, at a certain point after the exhibition was over. Uh, we received a lot of requests on uh, using these archives. So we started thinking, okay, but how can we avoid that this structure, this kind of structure that uh, you, you see in the presentation becomes the only way of using the archive? And also, how can we be serious in considering that the archive is not just uh, only a work of art, but it's something else, something that it needs to be fed, it needs to be activated, etc. And also, how can we question the practice, the praxis of uh, events making um, that doesn't consider different temporalities of working with, con with constituencies that are not contemporary art trained audiences? And this is something that also uh, John um, uh, explained a little bit before. So we came, uh, um, we decided to, uh, to push for, to, pu to really push for the acquisition of the archive, uh, which, which already exists online for free. Uh, it's a little, bit, which can be a little bit counterintuitive, but the question we had was, can we avoid that this collective project is seen, first of all, like a solo artist project, uh, but also is the museum committed to, is the museum ready to commit to this kind of practices? So uh, together with uh, a group of, uh, um, you know, like art, um, Tanya Bruguera herself, but also John was part of the group, I was part of the group, other museums, uh, directors, curators, of exhibitions, and the collection and the legal department, we decided to intervene directly in the budget of the museum collection. So is it possible to, make a, um, a shift between the idea of the purchase agreement to the idea of the certificate of usership. Uh, and this, I think it was quite, uh, you know, not easy to, to think about it because it took us like, I think, uh, almost uh, seven, eight months. 
One minute, okay. So I'll, I'll just close it here with the, with the part of the contract. But I think the point was that, okay, let's try to not using the, the budget of the exhibition, not use, using the budget of the pro public program, but really to intervene in the collection be, because the collection is what uh, in the end remains. So I'm just gonna finish in reading a section of the contract, which I think it's quite, uh, uh, I really like it and I think it's also quite um, interesting and this is the, like the real contract is not like something that uh, uh, like an exercise in that so in agreeing to co-usership of the Arte Util Archive the institution who buys carries out an act of generosity and commitment to support the public recognition of Arte Util. Strictly speaking, the Arte Util Archive cannot be owned by any party to the exclusion of any other, since it can be freely used or misused by anyone. The Arte Util Archive can, however, be part of collections. In this case, joint usership is secured through a one-off subscription fee, a form of remunerated usership paid by the using institution to the Association de Arte Util. Okay, thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I should add that the Whitworth has acquired um, the archive of uh, the Arte Util archive, so we can perhaps maybe come back to that later in terms of, you know, a very real example of how it's um, infiltrating the system of the the art um, the art institution. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so now I'm going to introduce the third speaker, um, Owen Griffiths. Um, Owen is an artist, workshop leader and facilitator. Using participatory and collaborative processes, his socially engaged practice explores the possibilities of art to create new frameworks, resources and systems. In 2020, Owen developed Ways of Working, a new community participation platform and company in order to work in ways he feels are urgent and can prepare us for the future. So speaking to climate uh, crisis, localism and radical collaborative projects. Owen was a British Council Fellow in 2014, working with artists and community growing networks across California. In 2016, he was awarded a Creative Wales Ambassador role, researching land use, community and participation through placemaking, food systems and regeneration. His long, he leads long-term projects, including Graft, a soil-based syllabus with National Waterfront Museum of Wales, Hinterlands Wales, the Travernog project that was shown before with the Artes Mundi and Land Dialogues with Glyn Vivian Art Gallery. He's an associate artist with Peak Art in the Black Mountains and Taliesin Art Centre at Swansea University. Over to you, Owen. Thanks, I'll just uh, start with sharing the screen. And slideshow start. That everybody hear me? Great. Okay. Um, well, dear uh, Fonvarian, thanks very much for asking me to be here today, and um, it's thrilling to be part of a, such an expansive and inspiring series of talks all the week. I've been really enjoying them. So, really, thank you very much. Um, I want to start by saying that I'm talking to you from Swansea in South Wales, a post-industrial landscape, a port, once the capital, the world capital of copper. Um, and once the one of the most polluted landscapes in Europe at one point. I mention this because post-industrial landscapes and their narratives and roots are in global trade, industrial wealth, and are deeply connected to museums and collections. The wealth or former wealth that built these institutions, resources, and places are therefore deeply embedded in labor, capital, colonialization, excavation, and climate breakdown. So these are times of multiple crisis interlinked by capitalism, patriarchy and white supremacy. So um, I want to start with this phrase, dig where you stand. This is a phrase I've been thinking a lot about recently and has become a kind of motto or a thing on the studio wall. But during COVID and during the shutdown, we've had an opportunity to re-engage and think again about our local resources or lack of them. Whether we think whether these are civic spaces, community centres, parks, food projects, or simply to look again at the familiar landscape which we live in. We're rethinking these things only through a time of crisis. 
So I'm interested in the idea of digging where you stand and working locally. Um, so this idea of localism is really critical to the practice that I've been trying to develop. So I wanted to just share with you uh, some projects that are in the square mile of my house and my studio, which have been in development since 2011. So they involve Fetch Fetch, a urban green garden, which I'll talk about in a minute, Graft, which you alluded to. We're doing some work at the Swansea train station, working with Transport for Wales, looking at green infrastructure and community development projects there. We're working on a project called Land Dialogues with the Glyn Vivian Art Gallery and National Museum Wales, looking at the collections and looking at land use. And we're working on a potentially a long, long-term project, uh, an anti-gentrification community design project, working with communities uh, and natural resources Wales around water and climate change in one street in Swansea called St Helens Road. So I wanted just to introduce those projects and the idea of what does it mean to work locally outside of the cultural capitals, outside, uh, literally outside in a lot of these cases, like on a canal, towpath, in a park, um, to hold dialogues in these places, to create feasts in the street, to hold workshops which question power and create radical educational opportunities for people, to make the case for developing long-term relationships with communities, creating more collaborators, digging deeper, changing policy, empowering place, and trying to be useful and sometimes failing at all of these things. Um, oh, I can't, for some reason I can't change slide. Oh, there it is, it's changed. Um, so the Vetch Veg project, so projects like uh, Vetch Veg and Graf, which I mentioned earlier, are urban guard green projects in my locality that I've been developing, have been and they've got them built into these projects are longer term caretakers and the idea of land stewards or, or long term collaborative partners. And these, the design and creation of these projects are really led by the need for that, those infrastructures to be taken seriously and to be built as part of their creative work. So this idea of governance, sustainability structures uh, and their, 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 their life beyond the initial artistic involvement are really critical to the way they take shape and the way that we talk about and develop these projects as collectives and as communities. Fetch continues today and is a garden for over 150 uh, local people. Um, it's just down the road from my house and um, what's ex extraordinary about it is that locally it's become this real critical community centre for lots of different people. They won recently a, a, a kind of campaign called the People's Park campaign to maintain all that green space that you saw there um, and to kind of create this idea of a community speaking to the, to the needs of, of what they need from sustainability, what they need from green space in the city centre landscapes. So this is a project which is in its ninth or tenth year now and uh, is still going strong and is developing more and more all the time. But this idea of land stewardship and connecting to um, landscapes that we live in locally is really critical to the work. And as is the idea of returning the museum to a site of collaboration, which is a lot of the, the questions and uh, work of the Art and Teal Network and the questions that John uh, framed uh, today's session around. Um, and I want to introduce a project and an idea around uh, how, one example of how that, how that developed. Um, this is a, a, a graft, uh, a, a, a community garden, an edible landscaping uh, space, which is basically the transformation of a green sterile museum lawn into this abundant edible landscape with a composting system, with beehives, with a cob oven, with a 40 foot polytunnel and a whole programme of workshops educating people around food to plate, uh, you know, soil to plate education and the connections between uh, the, the museum as an industrial heritage museum and, and food. So what this is, is a public commitment, not only to sustainability and climate and community, but to acknowledge the museum's role as a potential community centre with a responsibility to its locality, to climate and local green infrastructure. What we're trying to explore is the relationship between the museum and its constituents. The garden is an arena where this can be enacted slowly, where a radical shift in ownership and production can begin to take shape. We're also exploring 
the, the connections between the garden and the collection, the processes at play in a community project alongside a museum, looking at the seeds as a living archive of migration, ecology, diversity, and a collection of industrial heritage objects, <clears throat> and finding the connections of the common ground between these things. The next stage of this connection work that we're talking about is a new garden that we're developing just down the road in another institution. So again, we're working very locally here, talking, taking the graph volunteers and others to a new site with us to design a new community green space at the Glyn Vivian Art Gallery. This design will be informed by a community research project into landscape and land use and the collections at both, both these institutions. If we can understand the true narratives of the post-industrial landscapes and the connections between the collections, we can try and design a space or try to reimagine this familiar space again to make a truly radical new community green space informed by these histories of oppression, of excavation of materials, of capital and trade and their connectivity. What this is trying to do is create a new kind of civic interse intersectional space to talk about the role and the responsibilities of collections and galleries to, to their communities. How can a garden become the space to talk about these ideas as well as a much needed green and tranquil space in our case in Swansea, in a, in a, in a civic space which is going, undergoing years and years of regeneration and failing to kind of create uh, a kind of coherent idea of what a civic city, what, what, a, what a truly radical city space could be. So what's emerging from all these projects and connections is like an archipelago of local civic landscape work, demonstrating softly the ability for communities to take ownership to explore ideas of exchange, meaningful production and design led by sustainability and sociability rather than by commerce and regeneration agendas. <clears throat> we explored the ideas of ownership and land stewardship directly with communities in projects like Skyline, where we worked with three communities in the ex coal mining valleys of the Rhondda, where we got to know them, we met them, we hosted meals with them, we mapped local cultural important activities across, we looked at archival images, but we looked at these maps and made these kind of intersectional maps where we looked at the histories, the authors, the local traditions, the connectivities between all these points to really understand deeply this landscape. And this is all framed around a provocation of imagine if all the landscape that surrounded us was again in common use, it was a commons. What role will it play in the crisis of climate change? And what are the possibilities here for, for, for communities to manage their own natural resources? <clears throat> this land was once common. This land that you can see here is the Rhondda Valley in the Rigos, just the Rigos mountain in Treherbert. This land was once commons, farmland, broadleaf woodlands, full of oaks crisscrossed uh, by ancient walkways and bridle paths, where people would tell us stories about walking to the mine over the hill, over the top of the hill, and then walking home underground through a network of tunnels back to their own village. Um, they're now, you know, pine forests managed by Natural Resources Ready Environment Agency. They're kind of monocultural capitalist hillsides, which are logged at a loss, which, are, uh, which is just a timber, which doesn't, it's not construction grade timber. And these just, they're, they're just a, a landscape waiting to be reactivated. One of the really interesting things was that we had these amazing conversations with community elders who were adopting the roles of land stewards. They were with the goal of bringing young people back to these landscapes, protecting the natural resources for future generations. During this project, we met with sustainability experts, explored small scale crofting, created feasibility studies, looked at hydroelectric schemes, sustainable logging projects and alternative economic models of community ownership of these landscapes. We mapped the stories and the culture, explored the relationship and the materials that were extracted and their journey as part of a global capital exchange and the austerity that followed the 1980s Tory yeah. government yeah. systematic destruction of these communities and the connections between the mines of South Wales and the projects of empire. I'm gonna stay in the Rhondda Valley a little bit now, so we're gonna to go to the Trebanog project, but these slides are kind of um, 
uh, provocations and and kind of uh, a series of statements that John and I've been talking and working around. So challenging the patterns of dominance and power. These are kind of critical ideas to how these works take uh, take shape. So the Trabano project um, is uh, is a really interesting example of this idea of long term relationship, getting to know a community, and um, getting to playing at odds with the expectations of the cultural commissioning forces in these projects where you're expected to fly in make a make a work and uh, and leave and what's interesting about a lot of these projects is that i'm still engaged in a lot of these things i'm still engaged with these communities so models of friendship models of alternative collaborative ways of working are really critical and you can see that in the kind of in the way that we're trying to make these statements with the people there is no alternative the, the, the future is self-organized or what makes this good practice the idea of asking these questions collectively about what is the use of art in this context and how can we leverage its ability to do something that can raise the um, quality of life for people can create employment can create new green spaces or can create opportunities so there's no easy way to talk about the Trabano project because it's quite a long-term uh, uh, a thing. But essentially what we did as part of this idea of being parachuted into a space was we took over a derelict primary school. So this primary school became a space to think about, um, to think about the way that these things can, uh, can, can, can lead a center. You know, how do we hold the space for the community to gather? And how can we talk about alternative pedagogy in a way that makes sense to most people? a lot of the terms that we're using today about constituent led and things like this we i would never use those uh, in projects a lot of the time so we have to find the language of transparency and of equality and look at how we kind of create the, the the lexicon of words that we use in those contexts so what we did is we took over an empty primary school we created um a kind of community center and we ran a series of site investigations and the original brief was to look at a green space and to redesign this green space for the community. And in order to do that, this primary school became a, a canteen, a workshop, an art school, lots of different things. And instead of buying the equipment uh, from Ikea or from anywhere like that to kind of create the space for tea or, or, or tables, we thought about how can we make that process uh, kind of visible? How can we make it a flat process where everybody can participate and shape that and I think that's really critical to all these projects is how do we make this how do we make these open systems of 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 ways of working so there's no mystery to what the artist is doing there's no kind of like oh it's weird and it's happening over there it's happening with you it's happening in this space and we're doing it together and it doesn't matter if it looks or feels like art it's about making uh, an infrastructure in order to be together and to talk about what we need to do so making tables uh, you can see there people making cups, we made aprons, we made all the infrastructure that we need to run an art school or a community centre, we made from scratch. And some of these th projects became social enterprises and they've sold a lot of ceramic work in different places around uh, South Wales, which is really nice. So there's money coming back into the project and supporting that. So <clears throat> um, I just wanted to kind of uh, go through that project and explain the complexities of that and also how we're now at a stage in that community where we don't have that school anymore. We don't have, we've created that piece of public green land and designed that, but the legacies of that work and the importance of those relationships are still alive. And maybe that's moved into a kind of allyship or friendship. And it's through the kind of richness of the engagement work that we did, whether it was the taking part process, which is a toolkit for community design, or whether it was the Augusto Boal games and the dens we made and the cardboard boxes that were carried across the estate to create different spaces for kids to explore their environment. It was all about bringing these things together. And in, in a way, these things are all still really live. So I just wanted to kind of present a couple of projects really quickly there. And just to draw into conclusion uh, where we are at the moment working with these projects. Um, so we've developed a new company called Ways of Working, which is a social enterprise. And the idea behind the project is that it's rooted in local ideas and local communities. So the map you saw at the beginning of those four sites, uh, five projects, the, the company is literally based in the center of that in a way. 
and the idea is that we're going to be imagining new ways of designing and realizing projects with communities at the moment we're trying to set up seed library uh, for local communities and because one of the things we were doing during graph uh, during the shutdown the lockdown was sending out uh, packs of seeds so from graft we've been ha uh, harvesting seeds from the garden there at the museum and sending these out to different people who sent out over 500 packs of seeds during lockdown so and we could see that people who were selling compost and seeds were saying that um, we're having uh, to restrict the amount that people can buy. So we're thinking, OK, so how can we get the museum and the project and the company to take that ownership and, uh, over these things? And how can we create a resource for, these, uh, for the next lockdown or the next challenges that we have to face as a, as a society and a community? So one of these things is to develop a seed library. Um, this is a new and developing uh, collaborative platform. And it comes from this point of urgency, because what, I, what I'm experiencing a lot of the time is that I can't wait for the cultural sector to catch up or to respond to the things or for local authority to respond to things because it's too slow and it's too late. So how can we create a space where we can actually respond urgently and how can we, how can we kind of create a, a, a radical collaborative platform that can do that and can move lightly? Um, and that's a, a work in progress. We haven't worked that out yet. That's a work in progress. Um, and also, how do we make a space to reconnect to the questions of, of, uh, of working with power and the problems of traditional participation models that can reinforce marginalization or co-opt narratives and culture of marginalized communities? How can we work in a way that questions and stops those processes and actually creates a space of equality and true long-term collaboration. So I'm going to finish probably a, a little bit early there, but I'm going to finish with a quote, if that's okay, Poppy. Um, this is a quote by Arundhati Roy, which which came up in an article during this uh, during the COVID shutdown, and it's something again that I've used on the studio wall, but we've also discussed with the groups that we're working with remotely during lockdown. But the idea that this uh, pandemic is a portal. So Roy says, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through it lightly, with little luggage ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Owen. That's a brilliant quote to finish on. Thank you. Um, we've had a few questions coming in, but before we um, turn to the questions, I just want to obviously give you each a chance to, to respond to what um, the other has said. So, um, John, do you want to start with, with any kind of uh, thoughts you've had during Alessandra's and, and Owen's talks? Yeah, um, I think that what is, um, as, as Owen's just pointed to, one, one, one of the things that is, is really necessary is to begin to think of how we can create spaces where we can act urgently. And I've been thinking a lot during the talks of um alessandra uh, and also owen about the that kind of traditional underscoring of artistic practices by the idea that an artist creates something that then an audience extracts an artistic surplus value from and uh, the idea that somebody by a biennial for example might parachute into a community in another part of the world, work with them, create something that might be ongoing, but then the real point is to represent that in the art world. And that's where often the financial um, hit and extraction happens. And, and how we can collaboratively undermine that, not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but to say that 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 is just one point on a broader rhizome of activities. And instead of enabling com communities to use art in the same way that artists might use art to do the real stuff that goes in museums and galleries, how can we work together to 
to rethink how local uses of art as a tool for social and activist change is, is the real stuff. You know, and that links to, I think, what Alessandra was saying as well about one-to-one -one scale practice essentially being something that can happen in the real world and not just the museum and gallery space. How those intersections happen, how we sort them, um, how we begin to think through those and activate them, as, as I said earlier, is just one of the many questions that we want to try and approach with decentralising political economies. But I think there's a shift going on now from seeing this kind of activity as potentially a good thing to do to saying now we need to step lightly through that portal by seeing how we can actually make this happen. Yeah, Alessandra, would, do you have some, um, any, um, what we've talked about today? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to like, uh, yeah, continue a little bit the, ref the, the reflection that John was saying and what uh, for me it's super interesting to, to, to see also, uh, and I'm glad that Owen presented his, uh, his amazing project is that sometimes work, like uh, if you say that you work in the art uh, in a certain kind of, you know, like environment, you are not taken serious because you say, yeah, but it's, you know, it's just art just uh, like the weird people just do their stuff. And uh, this is something that uh, uh, back in the days uh, was really, mm, let's say, uh, make me questioning why I was working in the art at all, because I felt this kind of fire inside, but nobody was taking me seriously. But I think that after um, I met Tanya Bruguera, for instance, and uh, after I met also uh, my former colleagues at the Van Abbe Museum, I saw that you can really do, you can really use the, the, uh, the art context as a sort of alibi to do something else. Because, precisely because it's just art, you can really like push uh, your agenda, you can really um, activate this one-to-one uh, -one scale practices, but also you can, uh, in transparency, so what also Owen was saying before, okay, we are artists, but you are working like in, a, in the um, outside. We show our process because this work and uh, this works and can really change things. So what I think, uh, and I'm glad that before Poppy, you were uh, saying, uh, you were referring to the article by Tai Shani, which I also read. And finally, you know, it was, uh, something in the let's say mainstream art press I, I think it's super important that uh, or at least I don't want to talk to for you but for me it's super important that I'm using my privilege as a person that is working in the academia but also in the museum um, to really make this point like art can really be the place where we can uh, change something and uh, collectively, not just because it's something that an artist said or a curator said, but because a group of people trust uh, in art. <laughs> so, yeah. That's great. Erin, um, do you want to come back to that at all? Yeah, I, I, I just was thinking um, when Alessandra was talking about the last slide that I should have shown, which was probably on too short, but the idea of the gentle work of the future. So what is the gentle work of the future? What is the spaces? What are the spaces? What do they look like? How are they authored? And I think, uh, as you said, this is the critical time to do that, to, to be, to move in different ways and to work with different partnerships. And um, it feels like um, a, a time of great urgency, maybe because I have small children as well. I'm very aware of the world that they will in inherit, um, but also the idea of um, of you know of global the connectivity between global inequality uh, uh, inequality sorry global inequality that COVID has explained or shown you know the cracks in the systems have been kind of really exposed now so we can see the interconnectedness on a much wider scale for people I think these are really critical times to to do exactly that work and I think as you say you know often I I think. You know, it's difficult sometimes working in a, in South Wales where there isn't such a European connection to in you know at, at the end of an M, the M4 corridor where this post-industrial part of South Wales, it's easy to feel a bit disconnected. But actually, what's really important is to realise that 
you know, the the kind of, you know, the importance of European connections, the importance of the connectivity between all these projects and the common ground and the common language that's starting to emerge. And I feel like maybe these spaces and these times have really helped to raise that, the, the profile of these projects. And also just the idea of like how, you know, often you, you can work, I can work here very locally and feel quite disconnected, but actually realize when you start to present this work to, to, community, to people that, you know, the closeness of these projects and the fact that they are still there and they're changing things is really great to realize that and to see that in a different context, to see how that's working hyper-locally and the importance more and more of this local work. Uh, I feel like that's really a critical uh, idea to take forward. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna to turn to the questions because we've got quite a number of questions that um, are coming in that I think are quite, um, quite rich and, uh, and will probably take up quite a bit of discussion, I imagine. Um, so the first question um, is posed to John, um, but of course, if all of you are open to jumping into these answers as well. Um, and John, can, can, we, can you say something about the links between one-to-one -one scale practice, activism and engagement with community art? Uh, yeah, um, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a really good, good question. I kind of was trying to address that in, in a little way before. Um, I think there's a, a very complex relationship between an art world system and, and, and community art and the idea that communities might also be able to do art, which is the privileged pair view of, 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 um, of, of maybe um, a different kind of class or a different kind of spectatorship. And, and, and what I think is actually necessary to begin thinking through in these kind of gentle authorings of new spaces is, is maybe how communities using art can actually generally and genuinely lead us to rethink what art is and what can be. Because it's still, you know, for, for, for almost two centuries, art as we know it or, 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 or knew it to be is being kind of quite fixed whilst it's incredibly diverse it could now be rumors on twitter and, or, or a painting there's some fundamental points of view that we see as making it art that we're all educated into some of them are still quite useful and um, that it might be time to reconsider and rethink and we might need to let go of some of them you know and we might so so for me it's quite a complex question community's relationship to to art is not how communities can use art as we know it to be but how communities can begin to use art in a way that can show us what it can become and how we can embrace that activity as, as change and, and, and the final thing for, for, for me on that which, which I'd like to say is it's something that I've been thinking about for well, well, well over a a, a, a decade within this 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 community of um, um, people and groups who have been engaged with useful art is is we shouldn't limit ourselves when we say we're going to use art for social action and change to quite a an identifiable set of tools that we see as art and which are therefore somehow good and, and immune from the kind of the machinations of neoliberalism because they've been quite successfully occupied. It, it, it's, not, it's not the tools we pick up to use, but how we use the tools we pick up. And I think our whole understanding of art, which can be led by communities in the way that um, Owen and Alessandra have been talking can, can really lead us to, to, to rethink how we can liberate art away from that kind of two centuries old kind of gold standard of, of what it should be and enable art to kind of begin to flow more successfully across and through the, the, the streams of semio-capital in, in a way that can really begin to disrupt it and not just symbolically represent it. So community is key, but maybe not in the way we think. We've got to trust that community 
to help us show how we walk through that portal lightly. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to an, another question. For uh, This one's for Alessandra. Do you think the possibilities for hacking arts institutions for community use and struggle differ between the countries where you've worked? Mm, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I just I'm familiar with some of the countries where I work, but not, of course, all of them, but sure, for sure. Um, I think that if I can, um, uh, I mean, that's something that I learned over the course of the year, working mainly in uh, gathering the case studies of the for the archive, right? So we have uh, a series of criteria, which are like rules <laughs> that we give of ourselves in order to um, identify what Arteutil is. But then, of course, uh, we don't want to do the same you know, mistake of uh, um, just set the rules for everybody else. <laughs> so these kind of rules help us in, uh, in order to contextualize a little bit what is, is in the archive. But of course, these rules can have to be adapted to different contexts and for some contexts doesn't work. And I think the same as uh, uh, my practice in trying to hacking the institution or I, I am a, an observer in some uh, uh, you know, countries where I'm not familiar with because I also want to learn how other people are doing. So if we consider hacking as a sort of, uh, um, you know, like practice for liberating knowledge from um, an, economy, uh, an economy of scarcity back into the community for people to use, of course, what I can do here in the Netherlands is very different from what I can do in my country, which is Italy, or like what uh, uh, we were trying to do in collaboration with the curators at SALT in Istanbul, because of course the consequences of our actions uh, change uh, um, in base of, uh, of our context. But I think that uh, as uh, Owen was saying before, like creating this network of sharing, um, first of all, uh, friendship, perhaps, uh, and solidarity, it's quite important because there is also, um, like you can, you can claim that other people in the world are feeling the same and are doing the same things. So if there is, you know, like, uh, um, how do you say, like some, somebody else that is doing that, it can be quite, uh, not only empowering, but it can really be important because you feel that you are not alone and uh, you are not just, uh, let's say, quote, quote, quote unquote, fighting alone. So at least for me, this was something that uh, it was super, it is super important when I'm trying to propose uh, this uh, idea of let's use art as a sort of alibi or as a, as a tool to change our condition. Of course, it's changing. It, it changes all the time. And also, also because I don't know <laughs> how to do it everywhere. So uh, I'm, it's fascinating, uh, you know, to, to be working in this kind of context because uh, it's always transforming and informing, you know, like itself uh, through the exchange with the other artist practitioners, activists, the, like non-trained contemporary art people, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to move to a few questions to Owen, um, which sort of relate to this idea of working um, outside. And, and um, so the first one is, how do you reappropriate the commons from private property? Buy it, lease it, ask the local government or a land trust to buy, buy it, ask for it to be donated, question mark. Um, do you work with the local government to use urban planning to maintain and expand the commons? Okay, um, so um, yeah, I think I think the commons has been a, a term that we've used a lot and we've heard a lot about in the last couple of years. But actually, I think the true meaning of the commons and uh, we've, we're, we're seriously disconnected from. Um, so a lot of this this work is an attempt to kind of bring that word back into usage or back into a collective imagination to reimagine a commons. 
So even though that um, those gardens are public spaces or, or, or could be described in some ways as commons, technically they're not commons at all. They're, they're, they're owned by local authority or by National Museum. But what we're trying to do in the projects is to subvert the usage and linking back to something that John was talking about, the idea that communities and uh, people, communities are the ones that shape uh, um, policy. You know, how can we, if we could, if we could get into a place where that is really deeply reconnected, if we could get to a place where actually we're using culture and community to shape the policies we have locally. And that's what's kind of happened in some of these things locally, in that some of these pieces of land which were earmarked for development and the, and the campaigns from the communities that we've worked with have kept them green. So they've changed those things locally in a hyper-local way. So whilst they're still not commons technically, there is an element of kind of investing in something collectively. And I was thinking again recently about during lockdown, I don't know if, 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 you're, if people are fortunate to live next to a park like I am, but the importance of that park during lockdown has been huge. And in a way, what I've been trying to write about the last couple of weeks is reimagining these, these places as commons. What, what would happen if we kind of re-collectivized these, these park spaces and these green spaces, rewilded them or, or looked at different ways of multi-usership where actually, you know, we really take, so most of the time we take these places for granted. So I think, you know, we work a lot with local authority. We work a lot in kind of long, sometimes very long and painful dialogues with local authority and planners and people like that, who again have that impression that it's only art, so it doesn't really matter or whatever. And then slowly they see that actually the art thing that they thought was this soft lefty thing that was happening over there actually gradually gave people ownership over space. So it allows, you know, the process of these art projects allows things to take root and that's what we're trying to do really. And what was really nice about the graph project was one of the ways that the community um, secretly started to plan to keep that space green was to uh, plant apple trees. So they planted Welsh heritage apple trees out in the space and uh, suddenly, and they, they named it, they claimed it as an orchard. And I think there's something really nice about that kind of direct action, which comes from community, but comes back to that thing of how we met, how we make that space together through the artwork. So I, ho I hope that answers some of those questions about how we negotiate landscape mm -hmm. and the idea, the poetic ideas of the commons, but also the idea of how we try to make, you know, one of the things I forgot to mention, for example, is that the gardens, uh, the raised beds, the compost systems, the beekeeping that we do, all of these things are workshops or are curriculums in a way. So everything has been built with the same couple of, with the same carpenter and he teaches that work locally. He lives just down the road. His name is Avion. He's an incredible carpenter and he works with the communities to teach them how to build those raised beds. We work with a local beekeeper who teaches young people uh, from a, a pupil exclusion unit in a local comprehensive school to become our beekeepers. So there's uh, four or five kids who come once a week to learn and look after our bees with us. And they're responsible for those for that thing. So it's about saying that these knowledge systems and these skills, they might seem, you know, I don't know anything about gardening or I don't know anything about carpentry, but through the project, we can make them open source uh, uh, technology. We can make them uh, uh, part of the commons in a way. And that's what we're trying to do in the projects. Okay, and, and someone's asked, um, obviously within that, is there any resistance from the local community? Because obviously we can't assume that there's just um, a general consensus across the community. So I don't know if there's any, <laughs> it's probably lots as there are in life, but um, is there any you know, particular kind of um, instances or surprises that you know, you've, you've had to work through? Yeah, there's always a uh, resistance and there's always um, uh, kind of um, who, who, what is this, you know, the like, uh, cause of, of what is the, what is the use of this project or why is it art or can you explain them why? Usually it's about why is it art? Why are you calling this art or why, why do you need to call it art? And in a way that's the least uh, important uh, part of the identity of a, some, of a project like that. Um, but resistance uh, uh, generally uh, is fairly, low because what we're doing is is really gentle work 
So it's really, it's really about offering a space. And if you, and of course there is resistance. I'm not, I'm not trying to paint a utopian picture of what it's like to do this work. It's very frustrating at times, but also what we're trying to do is, is make a space where you respond to the community's needs so that you are actually hoping to create something which is useful or which is uh, kind of calling into question what and how we live. So yeah, we, 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 we kind of, have that resistance often but usually if the way around it is to kind of work with people um, in a kind of empowering way to kind of hear voices to make spaces through things like food or feasts or you know communal gatherings where you can actually hear those ideas and respond to those things like skyline for example is a really interesting one because we explored so many different options for that landscape and that's going into the next round of that project now so we've, we've uh, one of the feasibility studies that came out of that is to look at uh, small scale uh, uh, logging. So one of the things we're looking at is to say, how will, uh, how will that logging be done with local people using horses and going back to the landscape to do a, a traditional way of managing that landscape? So, you know, some people are resistant to that and some people want, uh, you know, motorbike parks and things like that, but it's about compromise and it's about saying that these things We'll have a kind of um, a democratic space which we can talk about them and we can develop them but resistance happens all the time yeah okay i'm gonna rush through these we've got quite a few questions coming in which is really exciting but i know we're running out of time so i'm going to try and put a couple together um one was um, aimed at Owen again about how we stop this work being interpreted by soft capitalism and then they reference the program manctopia which i don't know if anyone else has been watching um, which is the million pound property um, development look about the vast and um, very rapid urban development of Manchester um, mm. but in that they put a yoga class in a new build apartment block to encourage a sense of community for potential buyers um, and I guess tagging on to that question so holding that there how is this work being in you know stop it being interpreted by soft capitalism um, is it exclusive to the museum gallery artists um, a second question is also uh, to Alessandra and John, which is how do we protect these projects from big money and associated big vanity, um, as art and museums are two of the most main conduits for funneling excess money. Um, so I wonder if you can um, respond to, to those two questions. So who wants to go first? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have a, a quick stab at that. Um, really quickly um how can you how can you stop the appropriation of these projects by soft capitalism you can't how can you stop um egos moving in to appropriate these kind of projects within museums and galleries under the present circumstances you can't what we can start to move towards is rethinking the how and why these similar tools are, are picked up and the differences of how they might be used by communities working with, with, with Owen in Swansea and, and how they might be used as, as yoga classes to, to try to form community in, in workshops. I think Alessandra touched on some really interesting things by the Association of Arte Util with, with, the, with the, the ownership and commodification of, of, of art and, and, and collectors and big egos taking it. If we shift away from aesthetic value and its objectification in artworks that you can buy to the idea of, of usership and how we can um, activate artworks um, via the kind of contracts that Alessandra was talking about, then we can shift the ball game of usership, which makes it far more difficult for art with a capital A to be appropriated by the 1%. It can be liberated again as a as a tool for activism, which which changes how we think about art. Yeah, perhaps I can add a little uh, thing about uh, this idea of how. Yeah, exactly. I agree with John completely because what we, if we think about usership, it means that it implies also misusership. No, so if you think about how social media have been used uh, like who knows if Mark Zuckerberg was thinking that sometime like in 2016 the Russians have been like influenced 
uh, influencing the American elections, for instance. So, of course, um, usership has a great potentiality in art because it's really uh, also changing this uh, um, way of uh, how capitalism works, but you cannot really control uh, uh, what people are doing. But perhaps it's also a, ref a question for Poppy because she's the one working in the museum. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, but just to be serious, yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult also to control how the institution approach the Arte Util archive, for instance, because it's for free online, you can download the, uh, the cards, you can do your own installation, etc, etc. But then, of course, if someone approaches us because wants to invite an artist to be part of an exhibition, of course, we, we are not the agency for the artist, like the institution needs to uh, you know, like uh, get in contact with the artists, pay the artists if they want to um, have a project, etc., etc., etc. But that, but then again, uh, I go back to what John was saying: you cannot really control usership. Okay. Um. Yeah, and I think you know that obviously has a lot to do with with the, the context we're in at the moment, um, with the funding structures behind um, our institutions and the measurements um, that are the pressures that are placed on them on how to measure themselves. Um, and the South Bank Centre, I think is a great example, um, well, a very um, upsetting example of how um, that need to create different income streams through um, property and, um, and you know, having made, turning it sort of estate into kind of cafes and restaurants and then that being, a, you know, the, the exhibitions in some ways being a driver for those um, these commercial units totally, totally, you know, restricts and and shapes what kind of program you put in those galleries. And um, that's a, a kind of very, um, very pertinent example at the moment. Following Oliver Bastiano's um, article in the Spectator this week, which is another um, article I'd recommend you looking at. Um, but finally, back on the, um, the, just trying to get some questions in before we finish in a few minutes. Um, I have another question. That's about how do we, to um, so all of you, um, how do you, um, how does your approach to Arte Teal and decentralising political economies engage with children and young people um, who have so much to teach adults and are often, especially during this pandemic, our most radical and creative educators for a reimagined, more socially just future? It's a nice question. Um, well, maybe I could uh, respond to that. I mean, I mean, we, one of the works, one of the elements of the of threads of work that we're doing at Graft is to work with the local primary school. Um, and we've been doing that off and on over the last year where primary school uh, relocated uh, one, uh, one year of the school into the museum. It's called a year at the museum and uh, the, the whole kind of all the education of that school took place at the National Waterfront Museum. And you know, one of the critical things that we get all the time, the conversations with uh, children and young people in the garden is that uh, their disconnection from food production, their disconnection from, oh, they don't know what a potato plant is and, and these things. Some people, some of them do, not everybody. But what's really interesting about that space is that uh, we've literally had people uh, take seeds and go off and develop gardens in their schools as a result of that project. So in terms of, uh, of talking about it within the art util context, I think it's just about not sometimes not even mentioning uh, some of these words and just talking about it from a perspective of common ground and just exploring how, yeah, maybe you, you used to grow this stuff with your grandfather or whatever it was, uh, what that connection is to you and thinking about, well, how can we make a space where we will say, where we'll say, well, you know, we could do that again. So, sometimes it's about offering the space to just to have those conversations but i think um critically it, it, it's completely uh, it would be a huge, much bigger part of the projects now moving forward with how do we engage with children around these uh, around these projects is really critical mm -hmm. i'm going to keep it brief because i know i've got much left yeah we're, we're oops, sorry. yes i'm on mute um yeah, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, there's just a quick question that's come in about, again, about the role of vigilance, awareness, discernment via education and communication to see the signs of commercial appropriation from market forces. Um, is, yeah, is there a role for vigilance, awareness, discernment in these projects, of course? Yeah, 
Um, I think one of the things that we might need to do as part of the shift is, is begin to move from an, an idea that art's about aesthetic value and rethink how we might evaluate art and how we use it and, and all of those questions by thinking of its use value. And, and we, we, we've had two centuries in which use value has been detached from art. Art should be useless. And maybe we need to rethink it in terms of it, 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 its use value, which is, as you know, Marx reminded us, was kind of bodily and qualitative. And, and that, you know, the whole thing of usage is a way of rethinking that, I think. That's great. Okay, well, I, I know we um, we better end that session there because I know there's um, there's a bit of prep for the, the next session that's starting at two o'clock, which I hope everybody's able to um, continue to um, to attend and be with us. Um, thank you so much to the three of you, Joe and Alexandra and Owen. It was really brilliant, and there's lots um, there's lots of um, ideas and thoughts there, and especially yeah. questions that have come in. Kind of. Um, have a sharp focus on some of the points that you become more familiar with. Um, so, so thank you to everybody that's um, sent in questions and thanks very much to the Colloquium team for inviting us to do this session. We've, um, we've really enjoyed it. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>